The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everybody, to um, our i webinar this afternoon, um, Improving Water and Energy Efficiency Through Technical Assistance. I'm Laura Barnes, um, the Executive Director of the Great Lakes Regional Pollution Prevention Roundtable. Um, I first want to go through a little bit of housekeeping. Um, there will be um, an evaluation um, feedback form um, after you exit the webinar today, and I would really appreciate it if you guys would fill that out because that way we know, you know how we did today and then what you want to hear about um, in the future. Um, today our speakers are going to be Dan Marsh and Mike Springman from the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center's Technical Assistance Program. Um, they're environmental engineers here and they've um, been working on i since the project started. It's currently in its fourth year and is an ongoing project. Um, we'll be taking questions at the end of each talk. Um, Dan is going to first give an overview of the project, and Mike is going to um, give you some more information about specific projects that have been undertaken by, by specific companies. So right now, I am going to um, turn control over to Dan and Mike, and they will be ready. They should be ready to go. Okay, can uh, people see this now, Laura? Yep. Okay, great. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning to some of you in the uh, West Coast. Uh, welcome to uh, the webinar. Here again, uh, my name is Dan Marsh, and we're going to be covering the Illinois Conservation of Resources and Energy Project that we've been doing here in our um, uh, Emerging Technologies Assistance Program at the ISTC. Um, you'll hear me uh, refer to it as i from here on out pretty much. So moving forward, the i uh, project supports the EPA's Region 5's uh, pollution prevention priorities, namely reducing hazardous materials, reducing energy, greenhouse gas emissions, water use and costs, and then finally assisting businesses with lean and green operations, and as you can see, uh, region 5 is comprised of the following six states, Illinois, Ohio, Michigan, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Indiana. Moving along, uh, i strives to achieve energy and water conservation in smaller central Illinois communities and businesses providing technical assistance to improve efficiency in water consumption, wastewater generation, energy consumption, and uh, bottom line, carbon emissions. And this is a picture of a typical Illinois community and relative of, uh, representative of the size of many of the communities we've been working with. You see uh, a lot of cornfields around our towns. Welcome to Illinois. i objectives, um, specifically reduce energy use, water use, and wastewater generation. And secondly, promote water conservation, energy efficiency, E2, and you'll hear me refer to e, uh, E2 many times throughout the presentation, and pollution prevention, P2. Uh, relieve demands on local resources and restrain uh, upon, and, and the strain upon local system capacities, allowing communities and businesses to thrive without tapping into additional resources or expanding infrastructures and making capital investments. Now, <clears throat> this slide shows some of the methodology. I've listed a number of steps here. Uh, we're going to focus on uh, the, the first step. It's in color blue, as you see in front of you. And the, uh, slide, the slides following this will be relate, related to that. And then you'll see the slide appear a few more times. That's uh, the first, our methodology in starting up this new project. And, and we're going to be talking about the first two years of our project. <clears throat> the first year involving identifying and recruiting our partners, our stakeholders, and participants. In this case, municipalities, businesses, and associations. So that involved a lot of project marketing and forming working relationships and, you know, cold calling, you know, picking up the phone. Um, more effectively would be uh, in-person, one-on-one kind, of, kind of meetings. And, and probably the most effectively is, is using networking, uh, relationships with associations, conferences, shows, uh, our client database, and then uh, utilizing and, and capitalizing capitalizing upon our personal contacts and, re and relationships that we already have, you know, uh, 
amongst the, the field uh, that we've been working in. Um, we prepared some marketing materials, nothing fancy, simple handouts, flyers. Uh, we utilized PowerPoint and some presentations just to get the word out uh, to the groups or the individuals or uh, you know that we were uh, meeting with. And as you can see, I'm going to kind of work from uh, uh, you know off the chart here. Uh, we in the first year, the first two years, we worked with uh, three municipalities. Uh, we uh, projected. Uh, uh, we, we worked, uh, I'm sorry, uh, we uh, presented to a number of organizations, associations, you see eight of those, water and wastewater associations, uh, some business associations. Uh, that involved uh, around 50, 60, here, I said 57 here, uh, water and wastewater associations, uh, regional associations, and, and looking at the total numbers of people we've talked with in that first year, almost 300 people. And then stakeholders. Moving right along, uh, we consider our municipality uh, partners as stakeholders in the whole process. The water and wastewater associations, obviously, uh, they're a, a key stakeholder in, in, in our project. Vendors, contractors, consultants play a role uh, as well. And then I put another category in, the Illinois EPA Office of Pollution Prevention. Uh, we utilized their, their group. Uh, we utilized a, a program they have of interns, summer internships. And uh, you know we we have a good relationship with this uh, with this office, and we value them as a uh, stakeholder in the project as well. Now, looking at our methodology, uh, moving down the chart here, performing on-site assessments, which are multimedia focus. Uh, we look at a variety of areas. We don't go in with a checklist and just pigeonhole ourselves and just looking at these items. But we take a broader scope. And we, we, we uh, involve and look at best management practices for, for a particular sector industry we're working within. Uh, evaluating and, and prioritizing, prioritizing opportunities um, with, with the uh, client. And then working with the client to develop strategies, strategies to implement P2 and E2 improvements. So that's the section I want to just focus in on. Um, our multimedia focus that I mentioned previously uh, we looked at at um, efficiencies or opportunities involving uh, electricity, natural gas, water, wastewater, and then working around the wheel here, um, solid waste, hazardous waste, ultimately looking at uh, carbon emissions reductions. Now, most of you have seen, uh, and this is probably not, you know, I, I borrowed this. This is the inverted pyramid. This is the uh, ranking that we like to work in. This is our, our, our order. We first focus upon source reduction prevention because that's where you get your biggest bang for your buck. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, so uh, you work in that area. That's where we try to focus most of our attention. And then we look, uh, look at re reuse and recycling on site or in process. And then working down the chart, uh, we, we look at reuse and recycling off site and then least preference is obviously treatment and disposal. I refer to those areas as the antichrist to pollution prevention. So um, I try to uh, focus most of my efforts, obviously, up at the top of the pyramid. Now, this is an actual lighting changeover. And so this is representing what we would be involved in with electricity. Um, and I'm just, in the next few slides, are going to show you some uh, E2, energy efficiency, and P2, pollution prevention applications. So that's what I'm going to go through here real quickly. I did not Photoshop this. This is halfway through a lighting changeover. The right side is energy efficient for us, and the left side is high pressure sodium. And uh, the left side is the energy hog here. It, it consumes pro uh, roughly 460 watts per fixture. The right side is, is under 200. Um, you got white light on one side, yellow light on the other. So which side would you rather work in? I mean, uh, obviously, it's the right side. The beauty of it all? Energy efficiency here on the right side, 54% energy re reduction, uh, energy savings for this uh, for this facility. Looking at some other opportunities and applications, um, we we uh, work in the uh, compressed air. Um, so we look at compressed air systems, uh, which are often neglected and abused. Uh, the typical attitude out there is, oh, if they need more air, hey, no problem, we'll just turn it up, uh, turn up the pressure, and that's pretty much, you know, the way it's uh, way it's handled. 
what we do is we go in and look at a um, systems approach. We look at how, where, and why air is used, and then we start looking at the components. And I just threw out some uh, components here, uh, some alternatives are to uh, compressed air, like efficient uh, safety guns using blower motors instead of compressed air. Compressed air, if you look at in an industry, um, in a facility, it's their most expensive utility. It's often uh, the most neglected and abused. So this is a huge opportunity. Motors are typically the largest energy consumers. If you look at it, just uh, you know, categorically at a, uh, you know energy use in a in a facility, um, they're everywhere. So when we look at and see dampers and valves where the motor is operating at full speed, fighting against it, it'd be like driving with your uh, your foot on the brake and the, and the accelerator at the same time. And that's what's going on here. So. Uh, if, if you can match the motor speed with the flow and, and the load that is, is required for the process, just a 20% reduction in motor speed and flow can result in a, in a 50% energy savings. So it's huge, huge opportunity. There's, there's money um, uh, just being wasted uh, when, you, when, you, when, you, when uh, dampers and valves are used. So I have a little table on the side. Mike's going to... Going to uh, uh, talk more about variable frequency drives in his portion. So enough said with that. We look at, um, you know, if it applies, we look at process heating. Uh, they pose significant opportunities. Uh, we investigate ways to improve combustion efficiency, improve design, and recover waste energy. This is a photo. On, on the photo on the right is a, is a powder paint curing oven. It's about 40 feet long, about well, 6 feet high, um, roughly 400 degrees inside, and you can see it's wide open. Uh, and it runs all the time. And you can see it's running right now. There's not one product hanging on, the, on, on that. So there's huge opportunities. That line we identified ran 25% of the time uh, with no product. Huge, huge opportunity. Now looking at water conservation, because uh, uh, the i project does focus on water. And even though we started uh, in 2008 and 2009, those are record water years. Prior to that, we were in a drought here in Illinois. So, um, so it was a main, you know, so, so the focus uh, kind of slid, uh, you know, public focus uh, kind of waned a little bit on water conservation when you have record rainfall years. But when you're talking about using uh, industrial, you know, uh, applications or water, there, there's always uh, opportunity there. Scientific control, uh, as, as we're looking at this slide, is a means of reducing water use. Rather than continuously overflowing rinse water, which you see in these tanks here, roughly on, if you see on the one on the right, those are flowing, uh, there we go, uh, continuously. Whether there's product in there or not, whether uh, people are working in that department or not, once it's turned on, it's running continuously. So rather than continuously overflowing uh, the rinse water, Controllers regulate water via a system of sensors. And I'm going to show you the sensors. That's what the sensors look like. Those are electroless sensors. The analyzer, that's the brain of the system. And this right here is a solenoid, which receives a, a signal from the analyzer that has preset uh, upper and lower limits and will uh, tell the water, uh, the water line to turn on or off, to, to, flush, uh, to flush out the tanker top. Um, it wasn't unusual for us to see 70, 80, 90, even in one case, 95% uh, reductions in water. Uh, in this application over here on the uh, right here, this tank right here, that operation paid for itself in about four months with that system. Huge savings. Another technology that we uh, utilize uh, where, where we can and, and where there's an opportunity is ultrafiltration. That's you, this is a technology that involves membrane separation. It's a membrane uh, separation technology that purifies process solutions. It could be metalworking fluids. It could be uh, aqueous uh, cleaning tanks. A variety of opportunities there. It continually, it continuously reclaims and recycles those fluids. It extends the chemical life and conserves uh, raw materials. The middle photograph, I, you know, I, I don't need to really go through all the on the ins and outs. We do have fact sheets that explain all this. And uh, this here, this popped up. How do I get this one? Sorry about that, guys. 
Um, the most important thing here is looking at the samples before and after. This is before sample and this is the after sample and it looks pretty much like the virgin uh, material that's been processed. These are what membranes look like. This is just one type of membrane. These are, these are polymer membranes. So we do have a couple fact sheets that we can, uh, uh, we'll be referring to later. And if you'd like to read more about this, please feel free to look at those. Green chemistry. Uh, ICOR works upstream in the environment, uh, reducing environmental impact by reducing energy and water use and minimizing waste. Uh, green chemistry strives to re replace harsher chemicals with more environmentally friendly ones. Let me uh, show you an example of this. This is one. This is a common um, sink and drum parts washer that uh, utilizes, um, in this case, an aqueous solution, a soapy water, for lack of a better word. It's not solvent. So this system replaces solvent. So uh, it's safer for employees, it's safer for the workplace, and it's safer for the environment. And it cleans just as good as solvent, by the way. Recycling. We look at recycling opportunities. Uh, we do dumpster diving. And so uh, we're always combating the throwaway mentality that is so prevalent in our society and within our industries, uh, manufacturing sector, because they're involving and made up of people. Um, economically speaking, recycling saves money. Environmentally speaking, it's the right thing to do. It, it makes sense. So these are actually some pictures that we saw uh, out at some of our facilities we, we uh, were at. And uh, this is what we saw. Some of the things should not be in there, as you can see. So for the first two years, the i uh, numbers look like this. Our participants, uh, we had three municipalities, 29 businesses. Um, their, you know, their, their automotive, farm, uh, heavy equipment uh, manufacturers, water and sewer plants, schools and hospitals, grocery stores, and hammer makers, believe it or not. So we had a wide spectrum of participants. And in this chart, you can see uh, it's mostly uh, manufacturing. 75% uh, are manufacturing facilities. And then you have the municipalities public and nonprofit, retail and service, that would be like the grocery, uh, had a grocery store, uh, and a distribution uh, facility. So moving right along, and um, I think we're good on time here, uh, the methodology involving conducting and evaluating pilots and developing case studies. If you'd like to learn more about any of these technologies or applications that um, I've spoke up briefly, and I apologize because for the sake of time, I couldn't go into more depth on that. Um, but you can get further information on our website. It's uh, www.istc.illinois.edu. And the first uh, three on this list here, the recovery of steam condensate utilizing membrane technology, that's the ultrafiltration I was talking about before. Um, that was a, a case study we did during the first two years of this pilot uh, of, of our program here, uh, i -Corps program. Reducing energy usage in water and wastewater treatment facilities, a tale of two cities. That's, a, that's highlighting two of the three cities, would be Greenville and Bushnell, two small towns in Illinois that, are, that were a part of this. And reducing water consumption, kind of keeping control at Harris Broadcast Communication Division. Uh, that's utilizing the kind of controllers um, that was on the one slide, uh, continuously overflowing their water. So you get specific information and results from, uh, from that pilot on that fact sheet. And then additionally, I want to throw these in so that way you might uh, you know, want to look at these as well because they're of interest and they're all related to the subject matter today. Ultrafiltration, inline recycling, and multi-stage parts washer process fluids. Um, that was just recently done. Uh, so obviously that wasn't done within the first two years of this, but this still is a fact sheet you may, uh, may be of interest to you. Executing a successful lighting changeover project. It takes a little different slant on, on lighting. It's not just talking about the different methods of lighting, but it talks about implementing a successful changeover. And then we had, it ran into an interesting uh, situation of having uh, two, two vendors to a, uh, out in the field that were competitors that worked together in a synergistic uh, manner uh, for a common interest in a common client. So that one is a vendor synergy, energy efficient water and wastewater treatment in Effingham, Illinois. And then uh, Shedding Light on Water talks about light and uh, water conservation from one of our older, uh, one of our older uh, projects. And then the visible cost of air. 
talks about the opportunities related to compressed air. So if any of these would be of interest, just go to our, uh, feel, uh, feel free to go through those, uh, see our fact sheets on, on our website. i project challenges and obstacles. Now these are the things that are outside our control. As, as I mentioned, this is the first two years of our project involving 2008 and 2009, and most of you recall what happened in 2008 in the fall. There was the Great Recession. Um, businesses' response um, was immediate and swift. Uh, they started reducing hours immediately, cutting back people, uh, freezing capital. Companies that we had talked to previously that had two years, uh, maybe a payback requirement, was down to six months uh, uh, payback or zero. They weren't spending anything. Uh, others, uh, and I can name them by name, which I, which I can't, I won't, but they were just trying to stay open. And we had high rainfall in 2009, resulting in less attention, what I mentioned previously about uh, water conservation. And the lack of state and federal financial incentives for water conservation. Here in Illinois, uh, in 2008, uh, through an energy uh, efficient um, policy standards, uh, there's uh, state and federal electricity incentives via our utilities that offers uh, basically rebates for electricity and, and uh, gas. Now this is, this is I just, some pictures I just pulled off the internet, but this is what I saw at a facility uh, that was just basically trying to stay open. Their response was to just keep people working. So they had a big truck patch and had people out there sunburned, uh, hoeing weeds, running tillers, just to make a company garden to keep people occupied. They didn't want to lay them off, so they were painting strips on the floor, they were washing windows, painting walls, washing floors, anything they could do, make work projects. Because they knew that if they laid them off, uh, they probably would not be able to get them back and, and they would be impacting their, their income you know, in their family. So they didn't want to do that. So they were dedicated to their employees wanting to keep them working. The silver lining through all this, the, last, the first two years, this is reaction to the ongoing recession was a tightening of the belt. We've all been there. We've all probably had to make budgets and, and tighten the belt on occasion. Um, this resulted in some opportunities. Uh, people started looking at conservation measures as a way of saving money. Just like that company that was uh, building a company garden, uh, I identified opportunities for them that would actually save money, value-added jobs that uh, would save them money and, and be more fun than getting sunburned out in the field. Um, but uh, that, was, that was either zero or very little cost, uh, capital investments. So uh, the other opportunities involved uh, process efficiency improvements, changing in technology and management practice. And ultimately, they, they came out stronger, being more lean and green. So what did ISTC do to address obstacles that were within our control? Well, this kind of sounds like a sales, uh, the number one kind of comes out of the sales uh, manual, is about qualifying participants. Uh, qualifying is a term that basically you're trying to understand their immediate needs. You know, understanding their organizational structure and culture. Every company has a culture, has an attitude, has a mindset. Identifying that and understanding that. Understanding their financial standing, you know, and, and, and what are the resources are. And then secondly, enlisting decision makers. Working high up in the, in the tree, what I call top of the food chain. Be like your CEOs, the CFOs, uh, which would be your, uh, and, and your general managers and vice presidents those kind of positions, rather than starting down at grassroots. And then one really important factor is developing a relationship, trust. Not coming into a facility and saying, hey, you know, we're from the state or we're from the U of I, we're here to help. No, it's, it's more than that. Uh, it's spending time with them, understanding their needs. Most people want to know, uh, they don't care how much you know, they just want to know you care. And that's our approach. Uh, and then finally, persistence. Timing's everything. And just knocking at the door or following up, staying on a schedule, staying on task persistently. So I just wrapped it up with saying a persistent trusting relationship with the decision maker is critical to the process. Those are things that, that we did that were within our control that uh, assisted us in, in implementing change uh, at our facilities. Finally, here's some of the results. Uh, these are our project outputs. 
municipalities, three. Obviously, we've already talked about that. It was Greenville, uh, Bushnell, and then Highland. Participant facilities, 29, again. Three case studies came out of that, out of those first two years. And then looking at just the recommendations we made, just numbers of recommendations, we were in recommended 480. They implemented 164. Uh, that's 34% implementation. That's phenomenal, uh, especially when you consider uh, the atmosphere and the timing of 2008 and 2009, what was going on. Now, looking at the numbers here, um, when it comes to, like I said, source reduction in, in some of these areas we work in, these numbers, we're looking at a million five for those uh, 29 companies, and of which some of those companies didn't do anything because they were basically staying open, okay? Uh, they have since may have done some things, you know, as, uh, as economies change, but uh, within the first two years, uh, we identified uh, an implementation of a million five, and that is a compounded a cumulative uh, for those years. That's 14 million kilowatt hours, 46,000 therms, 20 million gallons of water, over almost two and a half million pounds of solid waste, 3,500 pounds of VOCs, roughly uh, you're looking at about uh, 10,250 metric tons of CO2. Those are good numbers for uh, for the project, and we're 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 uh, we're proud of those. This is our uh, contact information for myself and Mike. Feel free, uh, you know, this will be posted. Laura, if you will give you information. It's on our website as well, and our staff bios are there. Feel free to shoot us an email or give us a call anytime. Uh, we'd be happy to help you any way we can. And now I will be turning it over um, to questions. We'll have probably a few minutes for questions. And um, Laura? Okay. Um, we did have some. a couple of were, um, were things that were really more directed to me, like accessing slides and how many staff does ICOR have, and I was able to answer both of those. Um, the, answer, the answer for those who, who um, were wondering is ICOR has two staff members, Dan and Mike. So, um, you know, everything that they've done, they've done. Um, and, and, and let me interject this. Keep in mind that's not too full time because we're working on other projects as well and doing other other tasks and things. So uh, we're not dedicated 100% of our time, each of us, on this sole project. Okay, right. and everybody well, out there understands. Yeah, one of the questions um, has to do with um, well, you answered. You actually answered one of them in, with a later slide was percent implement the, your implementation rate, and then barriers to implementation. Um, it was there, um, and then um, the 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 recession. Um, somebody thought was uh, too general a statement, so they, they wanted a little more. If, if wondered if you knew more specifically, you know, some more specific barriers to to convincing companies to implement. Well, I mean, like like that company um, that uh, was that had the. The farm, the the, the uh, uh, that's pretty drastic. They they were running three shifts, and they went and, and overtime, and they went down to uh, four day, uh, I think uh, ooh, three ten hour days or something like that, and uh, they made drastic. Another company, uh, they were they were barely paying their electric bill, so the recession, uh, and, and they 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 were hurt. Uh, so the recession, I, it's a general statement. But uh, the orders dried up, uh, capital, I mean, there was literally no capital at most of our facilities. So a lot of these implementations, a lot of the things we recommended had to have one or two things. Had to either have no cost or low cost, or in this case where we had the benefit of this rebate or this energy efficiency incentive offered through ComEd or, or Ameren, which are two large utilities here in Illinois, th those, were, those opportunities there were able to Incentivize change because those the clock is ticking on those incentives. So those are major drivers. Uh, you know, having that uh, electricity uh, rebate for some of the projects, so that way uh, allow these companies to make those changes. But there, but here again, I'm I don't want to just uh, gloss and say recession, blame the recession. It truly, uh, most of our facilities, the recession, it, it really was felt. Mike, would you uh, want to make any additional comments on that? No. So he's, uh, I think we're in agreement on that. So I hope I answered that question. What do you think, Laura? 
Um, yeah, I think so. Um, the, the the person who asked can let me know if, if you didn't. I'm sure he will. Um, another question that we got, and I think Mike may be dealing may deal with this in in his part of the presentation, is um, what were the energy numbers from the warehouse lighting side? Um, and I think Mike, you had I think you have data on that. I, I don't have anything that that specific. I don't think okay. there is one that they'll give an idea, an idea of what they what kind of reductions we're talking about. Now the one that I the slide I had there was a 54 percent reduction. Now we're talking about hundreds of fixtures. You know I have that number, um, but I'd have to you know it's. It's behind me, and I have to dig it out. I, I hate to hold everybody up. So, if they actually would like to know the actual dollar figure, if that's what we're asking, because it's it's, it's not like ten thousand dollars. It's 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 a big number. Um, shoot me an email. I'd be happy to. You know, I'm not. I won't be uh, violating any confidentiality because I'm not utilizing any names or anything like that. Okay. Um, it was it was significant. It was a significant contribution to the bottom line of that company. Okay, but that was for one company, right? That was just one on the okay. on the one lighting slide that I had. Okay, and then another person wants to know, um, because this was a two-year pilot, um, is it now a full program and fully funded? And I believe the answer to that is you're still receiving funding from US EPA Region 5. Yes, we are. Yeah. And, uh, and we've moved into more than three communities, and we have more than 29 uh, businesses. Um, so, it, it, and the funny thing about presently right now, Businesses are talking to each other. Communities are talking to each other, uh, referring. Uh, so I've not had to make a call, cold call in quite some time because uh, it's like mushrooms are popping up uh, around us and the word's getting out. So uh, it's kind of self-generating. So that's good. That's good. Yeah. I mean, it uh, makes uh, life a lot easier. And, but we still continue to qualify because we obviously want to qualify and work with uh, the best candidates, uh, those that are, that are serious about making change because we are a change agency. And we go in there right up front and say that. Um, and that's what we do. Because if we, we go in and wave our magic wand and, and, and make recommendations, but if they affect or implement zero, we've not really affected any change. So we've re we perceive our job as, in, that, in this case, we've failed. So we, we identify implementation. That's what drives us. I think, I think we need to conclude and move on. Okay, well, I do have, I have two more questions. Okay. Um, one person wants to know, in general, manufacturing is growing nationwide. Is this the case in Illinois? Is that something that you guys can speak to, yes, no, maybe? Repeat, repeat that. I, I, it's part of it I couldn't is get. The manufacturing sector in general in, is growing in the United States. Is that the case in Illinois? I mean, are, are, are there more manufacturers? Uh, boy, uh, in Illinois, there's some other... Uh, Things that are outside of our control that some of the businesses, you know, like uh, you know, some taxation I, workers. Yeah, I think it was like just. That. I think it was just a more general question about is okay, the manufacturing okay. sector because growing? I, in Illinois? I would say probably our our manufacturing base is probably shrinking in Illinois. Okay. Okay, and then um, somebody else wanted to know if the three case studies were all municipalities or two municipalities and one business. Well, the. Uh, um, Case studies, those three, I'd have to go back and look at it. One was, uh, um, there was one on wastewater. There were two businesses and one, and, and two businesses and one town, or, or two towns on one, on, on one case study, and then two okay. separate businesses on the other two. Okay. If I recall the case study. Okay. But they, I'm almost positive. And I think that... Maybe we should be moving along to some of the uh, yes, part that sounds, of this. Yep, yep, that sounds good. Okay, this is Mike Spreeman. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Mike Springman. And I'm going to be talking about lighting and motor efficiency opportunities we identified in the first two years of i -Corps. There's our uh, copyright. Anyway, uh, some of the types of lighting. Now, we, we go to a lot of different facilities, um, some manufacturing plants. We've been in, in hospitals. We've been in police stations and wastewater treatment facilities. So we see a lot of different things. 
I'm going to be talking about those. So I wanted to start off by just showing what types of lights that we typically see. And, and this won't take very long. But, um, this is a metal halide fixture. Um, it draws about 460 watts, and you'll see these again later. Um, this one is a high-pressure sodium fixture. It has a, a kind of a yellow light that it produces. And these typically are also 460 watts per fixture, if it's a 400-watt lamp. Now, this is uh, just a generic fluorescent fixture, it's probably like what you have in your office. Um, this one draws about 196 watts. Um, the one in your office, if it's a four-lamp fixture, and if it's a T12 fixture, draws about 168, 170 watts, something like that. Now, one thing that we talk about, we're going to talk about, or you hear all the time, are T12, T8, T5 fixtures. Um, the T means uh, eighth of an inch in diameter. So a T12 is is uh, an inch and a half. A T8 is one inch. A T5 is five eighths. So just to give you an idea of of what kind of things we run into. Now we're starting to see a little bit more of newer technology showing up. This is a, an LED entryway light. This particular one draws about 30 watts, and all it does is produces enough light so that you can put your key in the lock and get into the building and that kind of thing. Um, we see Cobra Hood area lights. This is a lot of what's typically seen in uh, on, for street lights and things like this. This happens to be at a wastewater treatment plant. They have a lot of, of uh, area that's outside. They operate 24 hours a day, so they need to be able to see what they're doing there, too. And usually what we find there are fixtures that were removed from another part of town and were, were put in out there because they needed some extra light. Um, these are some high-pressure sodium fixtures. Uh, this is on, uh, provides lighting for a clarification tank, I believe, at a wastewater treatment plant. These draw about 150 watts. Um, and they needed the yellow light out there because they, they didn't want to fight bugs when they went out there at night to, uh, to check the clarifiers. So this is a, a typical production facility. Um, things are going good. Uh, you know, orders are coming in. Widgets are going out the door. Money's rolling in the bank. No worries whatsoever. Lights are on. There's no concerns with that at all. And normally when people in production start worrying about their lights is when they come in and they don't work. So at that point, then there, it's a knee-jerk reaction. We have to get something in here. We have to do something in order to keep production. And we like to, to, to have them think you know, before this happens and see what kind of efficient things that they can do. So you know, we know about efficient lights. We know that uh, uh, fluorescent fixtures are are you know 47, 48 percent more efficient than metal halides. But why don't the companies out there know? You know, there, it seems like uh, every time you turn on the TV, there's a commercial for uh, you know GE or Sylvania light bulbs, you know that kind of stuff. Well, most companies don't know how much their lighting is costing them. They know that it works or it doesn't, and that's about as much as they know about it. Um, a lot of them aren't aren't aware of efficient alternatives, or they don't know how to apply them to their facility where the best applications would be. They don't know how much electricity and how much money they could save by moving on to efficient lighting fixtures. So why don't they know? We know. Um, what, in most of the smaller facilities that we work with, there's nobody who is assigned as an efficiency manager or sustainability manager. Those are more in the you know, type Fortune 500 type facilities. So there's nobody that has that responsibility. It's, there's no one there that that's their job. Um, you know, their focus is staying in business and making a product and selling that and, and keeping their customers happy. So that they don't have uh, the time to do the research to determine what fixture is best for their application. Um, and that's kind of where we step in. We help them do that. And then, again, they don't, they don't realize the significance of what their savings could be. They think it may be a few dollars, maybe $10,000, something like that. So we help them identify uh, what, what they, they could save. So one of the first things we do when we go into a plant, we talk to them first, and we find out what they do and their hours of operation, the number of employees, all that kind of stuff. And then we perform an assessment. And for lighting, we develop a spreadsheet that identifies the baseline of what they currently have now. Um, it identifies the cost based on their utility rates and their hours of operation, the number of fixtures, 
It provides a basis then for comparing savings against uh, uh, a recommended alternative. And then we also identify probably several different lighting options. I mean, we're not selling anything, so we're not tied to a specific product. We can come in and say, well, here's you have high intensity discharge metal halide or high pressure sodium lamps. We think one option could be um, going to maybe an eight lamp T8 fixture, fluorescent fixture, or perhaps a six lamp T5 fixture, um, something like that. So we give them options, and then for each one of those options, we provide them a materials estimate. So they have an idea of what kind of cost they're looking at. It's uh, Again, we, we, it's an education process. We want them to understand what they have now, what they could, what their improvements could be, and how much they could save doing that. And getting that, we identify their savings potential. We show them a simple payback of the cost of the improvements uh, against the savings that they'll have. And then we also show them different funding alternatives. We identify incentives, uh, like Dan was talking about, with our utility companies. Um, there also, there's a 2005 Energy Act that, that gives a tax deduction for lighting improvements of up to 60 cents a square foot if you meet certain requirements. Um, there's also private funding that's available. They may want to do a performance contract. Uh, if they don't have the cash, they, there are companies that still do performance contracts. Well, the, the company will come in and, and make the improvement for the client and then take a portion of the energy savings as payment for that until that, that improvement is paid off. So why don't we talk about fluorescent? You know, T5s, T8s, T, T12s, why are we talking about that? Well, the, the T8s and the T5s are two to three times more efficient than the current high-intensity discharge lighting, or uh, uh, and it's, uh, it's more cost-effective. There's a, a simple payback. Usually it's between two to four years, something like that, without any incentives. Uh, there's a high energy reduction that looks good uh, for reducing your carbon footprint. It has a, a good quality of light that's, that's very fluc uh, flexible. Uh, you can get warm light that's kind of pink, like what may you have in your living room or something like that. You can get a, a daylight equivalent, which is which we recommend because we like the quality of that light. It's, you, your eye picks up a lot more lumens than what's actually being produced, but it's because of the color of that light. And then you can also get a full spectrum light that is pretty close, closely equivalent to the sun. So if you're doing, doing color matching, say in a printing facility or something like that, you know, a lot of them have light boxes that have these daylight lamps on them, and they'll take the papers over and they'll compare the colors next to each other. But you can have your entire plant lit that way, so you don't have to go to a light box to do that. And then the next thing with fluorescence is they're instant on, and they're sensor compatible. So you can receive uh, even more savings by shutting off lights in areas that aren't being occupied by people at certain times of the day. So this is a specific application we worked on. This is uh, the Cooper Beeline facility in Highland, Illinois. They make uh, uh, electrical trays and, and things for industry and construction where the, the electric lines and stuff lay out. Um, this facility is 300,000 square feet. It has 250 employees. It operates 24 hours, six days a week. Now these two things are kind of important. The ceiling height is 30 feet and the lamp height is 25 feet. And the reason that's important is because that 25-foot mark is about the cutoff for a T8 fluorescent fixture application. Anything greater than that, you're probably going to have to go, excuse me, to a T5. Now, their primary lighting was high-pressure sodium, and this is what it looked like before we started. Now, you might look at this light and say, oh, well, that's, that's all warm and fuzzy and cozy and like sitting in front of the fireplace, you know, and on a cold winter day. But Actually, uh, I, when I walked into this, this facility, I, I really got anxious. It's, it was a depressing light. It kind of felt like there was a weight on my shoulders. And honestly, I really couldn't wait to get out back into the natural daylight. So this is I tried to get a side-by-side -side comparison of the same area of the plant for, for this photo. I had this in mind when they started this project. 
The problem I had is when they went to do their lighting project, they also decided to, to change the layout in their production processes and their aisles changed. So this is as close as I could get. But on the left hand side you see the high pressure sodium, the yellow light, and then on the right is, is the 5000 Kelvin uh, T8 fluorescent fixtures. There are eight lamps in those fixtures and those are Cooper lighting fixtures. That was one of the requirements. It's a Cooper family. Um, um, Matt Bockentin is, is the maintenance manager at this facility and he told me that this was the only project they ever did that they didn't receive a single complaint on. And the first comments they got were, why are we putting skylights in? So that kind of goes to the, the daylighting. Now, Cooper was also a little bit different is that they had examined their electric bills and they identified that they were spending 65% of their bill on lighting and 20% on compressed air and only 15% was actually being spent making a product that they sell. So they replaced 527 high pressure sodium fixtures, 76 T12 two lamp eight foot very high output fixtures and 308 T12 four lamp work light fixtures that you see over a workbench or something like that. Now, before they made any changes, they were spending $123,000, almost $124,000 a year on lighting. Through their efficiency improvements, they could save almost $60,000, which was about a 47% reduction. Uh, it cost them $130,000 to make these improvements, and their payback was about 2.2 years. And this was done before there were any incentives from Ameren in order to do this. I don't know if they claim their 2005 Energy Act incentive. I, it's possible, but I don't know. That's something we haven't followed up with them on. So the next part I'm going to talk about is variable frequency drives. Now these are, are, are better known applications for existing pumps, fans, and blowers. So most, most pumps, and then that's pumps, fans, and blowers, we'll just call them pumps. Most pumps have some kind of restriction to control the flow, and these are either mechanical or, or restriction, I mean, and those are either veins or dampers or valves that control the flow, or some kind of a mechanical means that acts kind of like a transmission, where the motor stays at a constant 100% speed. There's some kind of uh, mechanical control that, that transmits that power to the pump. And this is, a, this is a typical valve we see. This is an atypical damper. Uh, we've hardly ever seen anything this big. This is probably 10 feet tall. But it was a dramatic picture, and that's why I put it in. So VFDs offer economy to their, to their users by enhancing their production control process and matching, and they re receive energy savings by matching the speed of the motor with the load required. Instead of, instead of Dan, Dan used my example of, of driving your car, you know, when you drive your car, you use your accelerator to control your speed and your brake to slow down or stop. Instead of having your accelerator all the way to the floor and then controlling your speed with a brake. And that's kind of what you do without a variable frequency drive. Now, in industry, there's not a lot of VFDs out there. There's only about 9% that have been implemented. Um, but they're... Fans, pumps, and blowers, again, are excellent applications for a VFD retrofit. So one of the VFDs can match the speed of the motor to the requirements of your load instead of using a valve or something to do that. Um, the power consumption is equal to the cube of the speed, which is an affinity law. So don't get your calculators out and start looking for your second function button and stuff. We've got a chart that shows you all that. And then matching the speed requirements is probably one of the most economical ways uh, to operate your process. So this is an affinity law, and this says that if you have a, a pump that's running at 100% speed, it's going to use 100% of the energy. And if you close, reduce that pump to, say, 80%, an 80% flow, then you can save 50% of your energy. And, and it, the more you, that you can slow that pump down, the, the more energy and the, and the more money that you can save. This did in practice. Pardon me. There we go. So this is a picture of a typical variable frequency drive. So 
some of the advantages are you can put them on just about any motor out there. We have seen a couple places where you couldn't put them for some very large motors or some that had uh, uh, very high uh, voltage. Uh, it, it didn't really apply very well for that. They have a high starting torque. Um, they're easy to retrofit, and if something happens to the drive, it's easy to bypass that drive and go back to your original application until it can be repaired. They're very reliable. Uh, Lightning does do some tricks to them, um, and, but they have a significant increase in efficiency. I've got some examples of that coming up. Let's say you have a 100 horsepower motor and it's running 24-7 at 100% speed, but it's valve back, so you're only getting 75% of your flow out of that. That fixed speed cost is about $50,000 a year. And if you take that same motor running 24-7, but you slow it down to 75% of the speed and 75% of the flow, and you remove the valves from the process, then you can operate that pump at 21,000, so you'd be saving $29,000 a year by installing a VFD in that application. So the advantages are you have energy savings. It quiets your motors down because they're not running as fast. It's easy to install. It's compatible with existing pumps and motors. Your equipment runs continuously, so there's there's less starting and stopping because you're, even though you're, you're reducing the flow, you're delivering the same amount of product. It also eliminates mechanical shock to the system, and this is some kind, sometimes called water hammer, where it actually, when it starts up, because it's going from zero to 100% as fast as it can, it actually hammers pipes and joints and corners and could blow those apart. And, and you see that a lot of time in the summertime on, on water systems. Reduces your, your valve control maintenance. Um, it, it, you, you may not know, but periodically you have to go out and exercise valves to make sure that they're going to operate when you need them. Otherwise, if you need to shut, shut, shut something off, they're not going to work very well. And it reduces the heating in your equipment room, and this allows you also to prop, I'm sorry, to pump the proper mass. So here's some industrial applications. Um, this is a, a heating and cooling system. Actually, it's just a heating system. But you can, you can install a variable frequency drive there. Ventilation fans are also very good. Uh, process pumps, this is a, a parts washer. You can see this is valve back probably close to 75%. This would be, a, uh, depending on the size of this motor, that would be a good application for a VFD. And this is just a transfer pump. Um, these oftentimes don't run very often or maybe 50% of the time. But if you can slow that pump down 50% and provide the same volume of material, uh, you can save a lot of money doing that. Now, water treatment applications, this is water that you drink. So um, some of the good applications there are well pumps, where you can slow those down and have a continual pumping process instead of, instead of uh, large volumes be drawn out in a small amount of time. These are intake pumps that, that pump into the treatment plant itself. Uh, this is a high service pump down here in the lower right corner. These are actually 100 horsepower pumps, and these pump out to, say, a water tower. And then the water tower is gravity fed from there through the system. And these are an inline pump that if you have maybe a large water supply system, you may need additional boosters uh, somewhere down the line, and that's kind of where these apply. Wastewater treatment plants, again, you have lift stations that actually pump the sewage into the plant, um, influent station pumps, uh, again, that, that continue to lift this material against the gravity, say up a hill, something like that. Then these are aeration blowers. These actually blow air into the digestion process. These, in fact, are 300 horsepower motors. Um, uh, these are very large blowers. And then this down here is an aeration rotor that also imparts air into the digestion process, but it works like a paddle wheel on, on the old steamboats. Um, it just turns, and as it turns, it turns up the water and oxygen is imparted that way. Uh, I couldn't find a picture of a sludge return pump, but it's a pump, and it pumps sludge back into the digestion process so that it continue going, actually imparts the bacteria back into the digestion process. And then effluent pumps that pump the treated water out of the plant into some kind of a drainage basin. And this is a nice sign. I thought this is something you really need to put into a wastewater treatment plant. Um, so I just put that in there. So 
we had a small town, and, and I'm not going to mention the name because I didn't get specific information to use their name, but they draw their water from a, an impoundment. And they have one pump out there that does nothing. It runs 24 hours a day, but all it does is circulate the water around their intake so that it doesn't get silted up. Um, they put a VFD on that on that pump, saved 131,000 kilowatts and $10,000 a year. They also installed VFDs on their high service pumps, and these I believe were 100, 100 horsepower pumps, saved 700,000 kilowatt hours and $56,000. And they also installed VFDs at their wastewater treatment plant on their aeration rotors. That saved 354,000 kilowatt hours and $28,000. So in total, they saved 1.2 million kilowatt hours of electricity and $95,000 of energy. They qualified for incentives from the state of Illinois that paid up to 75% of this project cost. Um, so they only had to fund the remaining 25%. That was a sweet deal. Now, when we were putting this together, we started looking at the, at the different energy or electricity recommendations we made between i core 1 and i core 2 And we noticed that in i core 1, 92% of the electricity was identified as lighting improvements, where only 2.7% was identified for variable frequency drives. Now, next year in i core 2, that changed a little bit to where they're pretty much even. And we talked about this, Dan and I, and we think it's, there's a couple reasons why. One is because the incentives were changed so that variable frequency drives could qualify for the energy incentives. And then they could also, um, it, w it was a standard incentive instead of having to be a custom. So it's a simpler process in order to get money for that. And I think that maybe they started looking at, the, since the VFDs returned so much more energy savings than what the, uh, what the lights do, that that's, that was more bang for their buck, you know, lower hanging fruit, larger return. So that's kind of where we think that went. So you can see Dan and I both like this question sign. So I'm going to open it up for questions now. Sarah? Okay, we have I, one question. Um, one person wanted to know if there are um, requirements for communities or businesses to participate in the program. They want to know what, no. they, and, and, and if so, what those requirements are. Um, well, they're not required to participate. If they choose to participate, um, we accept them. We don't really reject anybody, I guess, but we're looking, I think what we're looking for mostly is smaller communities that have three or four large industries that are kind of where everybody in that town works for those industries. So we can make one change in the industries that benefits the community as a whole. Now, for water savings, you know, we could we could save maybe a million gallons a year at one factory, and to get that same million gallons of year a year savings, we would have to deal with maybe a thousand homes, ten thousand homes, something like that. So, so by working with the industries, we can reduce that, say, the water usage, and make that available for the residents. Mm -hmm. Um, easier than we could working with them individually. Okay. Um, another person wanted to know what what is the what are the best equipment or resources? Things like PCs, tablets, measurement, data loggers, calculators. Have you guys used while performing your assessments? Uh, this person is looking for recommendations. Um, if you don't have, if to put you on the spot. Um, we can, I can have you guys compile a list and I can send that out to the attendees after the webinar. Well, we kind of old school it. Um, we don't really use data loggers or anything like that. Unless we're, unless we're doing a pilot or something of long-term effect. But typically on our assessments, the, we, we don't do that in the assessments. So. Right, like for lighting, we, we can look at a fixture like a 400 watt metal halide fixture is going to draw 460 watts no matter where you're at. So then we count the fixtures, we, we multiply that times the wattage of the fixture, times the hours of operation, multiply that by their energy cost, and that results in your, your cost for that lighting fixture. 
And there's some software that calculates variable frequency drive, energy savings. So I mean, we're not uh, pulling numbers out of the air. There are some, some standard uh, engineering calculations, uh, mathematical calculations, and it's just physical counts uh, that you have to take and then factor all that into it. Okay. Um, somebody else wanted to know how you're getting your implementation data, particularly the savings from the companies. Well, we we examine their we get copies of their, their electric bills for at a minimum a summer month and a winter month, um, so we can we can determine what their rate is, and then we take an average rate for uh, using their summer bill four months out of the year and their winter bill eight months out of the year, um, and get an average rate working it that way. Um, Oh, and then we also use the uh, EPA P2 cost calculator. So that standardizes across the, the country, I believe, the, the energy savings so that it's, it doesn't change from one community to the, to the next. I've seen uh, uh, a large variety of electric rates in Illinois from as low as, I won't even think about where this person is, but 1.5 kilowatts an hour, or since an hour, to uh, up to over, over 10 or 15. So it just depends on where they're at. Um, okay. then we also utilize uh, the greenhouse gas calculator offered by uh, uh, the PTA to come up with our the, the metrics for the uh, MTCO2E equivalent. So for those numbers you see reported, we're using the recognized calculators of the EPA. Okay. Um, and somebody else wants to know if you promote Energy Star tools when you're doing assessments or when you're working with, with companies and communities? Uh, no, we haven't. Are you going to start? <laughs> well, I mean, we do, uh, like, it depends on, on the situation. If we're talking about office equipment or doing some, like, yeah, we do, we do, I mean, I talked to them about uh, the Energy Star equipment and the label and uh, things like that. And, and Energy Star does have some, I guess best energy practices, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. uh, for different industries or for offices or for sectors. So we do refer to those, but it's not one of those uh, that we hand out the. Uh, we, let me correct that. In our assessment, our reports themselves, we do identify that as a tool uh, that they can utilize uh, for for that. For example, like the Energy Star has a, a programmable thermostat calculator tool. Mm -hmm. We provide that to uh, to businesses to help them identify savings related to uh, programmable thermostats. So yes, we do re refer okay. to and recommend uh, the Energy Star, but we don't have a, a catalog in, of Energy Star equipment or anything like that and go through it line by line. Uh, also, the Ameren, Ameren is our electric supplier downstate here. Ameren has, on their website, has Energy Star um, links on that. So uh, you know, we, we always refer our customers to the, to the Ameren in order for their to get their energy incentives and, and so they can see that information okay. there. Um, and then um, are you recommending they do have you ever recommended that people use the energy star portfolio manager are you familiar with that I'm, I'm not familiar with that okay good thing that that might be something that would be worth um, reading up on and that might actually be something that would be a good topic for another webinar um, if anybody and I know people from EPA are on here so <laughs> um, somebody wants to know if you're finding any LED or plasma lighting, um, is it providing reasonable paybacks yet? If so, what is the pay? What are you finding the paybacks are? The payback time on, on LED applications, those are kind of right now. I see them mostly limited to things like vending lights, exit lights, um, freezers in grocery stores, um, cold. Uh, Areas where you're doing cold lighting in grocery stores, that's where I'm mm. seeing those most. Now, I haven't, yeah, and, and exterior wall packs, like I showed on that entryway light. Um, on, I haven't seen plasma lighting anywhere, but we have started to see a few applications for induction lighting to replace the, the metal halide, the high intensity discharge lights. And uh, the, there's a pilot project going on right now, and, and so that's still being evaluated how well those those actually function in an industrial environment. Okay. Are you getting any any idea of how long it takes to pay back, like the the LED switch outs on vending machine lights or and exit lights, where you've seen that implementation? Well, on the LED, 
you know, obviously you've got like uh, the LED exit signs that you know have been out a long time. Uh, the payback on those are just like a, a you know, they're the, the signs are like twenty five bucks now, uh, and there you've got LED retrofit kits that cost maybe ten or twelve bucks. The payback's like two three months on those kind of things. But now when you're looking at linear LED fluorescent, uh, you know, to, to to go against and replace uh, like T twelve fluorescent lamps, those are like forty five dollars as much as sixty dollars a lamp. Uh, and, it, and if you're trying to replace four lamps in the fixture, the uh, ROI on that is going to be very long. Um, we have seen a few uh, places like Cooper Beeline. They're in the, in the lighting business. They've replaced some of their office lighting uh, that had uh, uh, fluorescent in it with spot LEDs, dimmable LEDs as well. And so, um, and the, but they're one of the few. Okay. So one of the few. I, I was just thinking another application we do see them at is, is in spotlights for illuminating signs and things like that. Okay. But when you look at the calculation of the simple payback, typically like, especially on linear LED, you're talking like 20 years, 30 years. I mean, it's, it's way out there. But the prices are coming down. If you go to any lighting expo now, you see a host of LED. Um, and so I, I predict the, the price will be coming down significantly in the next five years. And induction lights, uh, good opportunities there. 100,000 hour life on those fixtures, uh, great light, uh, and some significant savings. So we have one facility where we're watching. Um, we want to do a case study on it, but we can't take photographs, unfortunately. Um, but they have 550 fixtures up. And they went from 460 watts down to 85 watts per fixture. So that's significant. It's hard okay. to get a message out and, and take pictures of lighting when you can't take pictures of lighting because you know, what is lighting? You want to look at it. Well, you know, one thing I failed to mention on lights, too, is we go through and we do the education process and give them an idea of what they can save, but we always always recommend that they bring in a lighting professional, somebody who does this for a mm -hmm. living. They're looking for specific applications for fixtures mm -hmm. they sell. So so they're, they get into more specifics on what actual recommendations for specific areas are. Okay. Okay. Um, are, does anyone else have questions? Okay. If not, thank you very much for participating this afternoon. Dan and Mike, thank you again for doing this. Um, um, before we go, I'd like to acknowledge Matt Cooper, Cooper or Matt Bockentine, I'm sorry, Cooper Beeline, and Chad Travnicek and Tom Elgood from Illinois Electric Works on helping us with the variable frequency drives. Okay, great. Um, thank you again for everybody for attending um, and uh, I will be sending out a follow-up email with links to the slides, um, links to the, the I-Corps fact sheets and Dan and Mike's contact information um, later today or tomorrow possibly and um, stay tuned because Glipper is going to be doing um, webinars much more frequently. Um, so if you have any ideas for topics you would like to see in the future, please again fill out the feedback the feedback form that you'll see upon exiting the webinar, um, or you can e you can contact me um, directly, or and and let me know what you would like to to have us cover in future webinars. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, we'll talk to you soon.